You're listening to The Valley Current. Welcome into the Valley Current. I've got a great person that I'm interviewing who's been a long time Silicon Valley uh, thought leader is the way I think of you, but you're gonna tell me more about your journey to Silicon Valley and how it got here because I think you've got a very unique story. I'll just set the tone that when I first met you and you're, you, you were in a startup team or just about joining a startup team, that eventually became Virtual Silicon Technology, if I'm remembering the name, VST. So welcome yes. in, Billy, because it's been a long time to get you scheduled, which is my fault. But thanks for coming on the show. But tell us a little bit about your journey to come to California, because you weren't born in California. You were born somewhere else, right? Yes, I was born in Arizona, but I came to the Valley in um, the late 50s. So... Um, and I grew up here, so it, uh, yeah, but I started in, in Arizona. I've been here <laughs> since, uh, since the beginning of, it seems like the whole, you know, Silicon Valley. Well, when you arrived in the late 50s, you must have been just a little tiny kid because you look like you're in your 40s now. <laughs> whatever you're doing, you're really doing right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I was I was a little kid. <laughs> you were probably a little tiny kid at the time, a little baby, but when you did arrive, uh like what were your parents doing? I mean, what what fields were they in? My parents were migrants. So they um they did labor jobs and um you know, work in the fields. Okay, so you were sort of a success story then for them. Yes, I. They didn't read or write, so I. Yeah, I had to. You know, I kind of grew up doing all of that. So, okay, um, because because virtual silicon. Just so the folks know, it's no longer in business. I want to say it got sold. It was in a field that was a very specialized field of design automation, which involved providing libraries of microcircuits to people that were laying out various chip designs and the like. So am I remembering this right? Because this was quite a while ago and that's the context. I want to say I met you 30 years ago, 25 years ago. So it seems like a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, be quiet, right? I, I mean, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get Taylor Scanlon, who was the CEO on the line and Mike Clement, who was, I think the CTO, because I tell a great story about they came into the office, the very room that I'm in, the very table that the computer is on, they're both old. The building is from the 1890s, so the building has been here forever. We were lucky enough to buy it you know, a number of decades ago. And they dropped literally a, a plastic bag full of documents on the table. And they said, yeah, we kind of have some ideas that we want <laughs> to start a business with. And we haven't had time to file because we're looking for someone to help us. But it's all right here. I'm sure you can organize it for us. And that sounds I, like it. I had to laugh because I said, you know, plastic? That's like, you know, can't you use, use like a, a briefcase? And they said, well, the next best thing we had was a paper bag from Safeway. <laughs> and we thought you would be offended by that. And you know what? Taylor may correct me and tell me, no, it was actually a brown paper bag. It wasn't a plastic bag. I remember it as like a plastic garbage bag that they literally <laughs> turned upside down. And Mike said, I don't have time to deal with this. Taylor's supposed to handle the paperwork. I'm working on some interesting design stuff. So when did you become affiliated with them? Um, right after they started. And then when I met you was when I came in, I came in to talk with you and Mike Milks. Um, Mike Bill Rish. Milk. Mike Rish, probably. No, uh, Bill, Bill Milks. Bill Milks, Bill Milks yeah. probably. About my patent ideas. Okay, and, with Mike Clement. Yes. And at Virtual, we were doing IOs and memories and PLLs and... Uh, standard cell libraries um, so we were doing all kinds of things and then testing them but they had they had a lot of products at the time I mean what people to this podcast wouldn't necessarily know is there's a whole field of technology 
that supplies tools and essentially data and various types of, of knowledge products to the microchip industry. That is to say, people who are designing, like say you're designing a new video game console, you are relying on a whole ecosystem of suppliers to give you the various electronic deliveries of various chip design types of, of data and knowledge products to enable you to very quickly build the electronics for that piece of plastic. That's true for cell phones. That's true for you know uh, pagers, although people don't use pagers anymore. That's true for all sorts of electronic devices that are out there. At the time, a lot of the what we were doing and, and other companies were doing were building things, you know, and making money on it. But then the foundries started making all the parts, you know, like the standard cells, the IOs, and it kind of uh, killed that market. Right. You could argue that what played out and no one saw it was there's a natural complement between the factory that's going to manufacture the actual part and the blueprint that is created by all of these tools to get the factory to do so. Kind of like the integration between the Tesla design team and the Tesla factory and that they started to give away the design and the design tools to get people to manufacture in their factory. Exactly. You know, it's it one of the things that happened, you know, a few years before that was that there was two people that made there was VLSI technology and there was Artisan that made standard cell libraries and everybody and well I I think IBM also made them, but um so everybody bought you know what I mean so there was a big market for standard cells and that's what I was an expert in at the time. And um and then Artisan decided to make them free. Right, free. So in it, the sense, it killed the market. So right. then, the, But free in the sense, they weren't really free. They just metered it based on the manufacture of your product. They spread the cost on, we're now going to charge each individual unit we make effectively a small license fee to, to make up for all the tools that we're quote unquote giving away. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I, I don't know about how, how those things had happened. I just remember that when the uh, artisan said that, uh, you know, they made their libraries free, that's when the different foundries started making their own libraries. And it was like the whole market was kind of like gone within like two or three years. So, um, we were doing at virtual was making specialized libraries. You know, we would make a uh, rat radiation tolerant standard cells, um, you know, different types of standard cells that were not off the shelf for the, at uh, the foundries. Right. So, but we followed the foundries rules for, so we made, you know, a combination of them. So, so you really learned a lot of stuff that was kind of very on the job practical learning of how to do design automation and what might be called the nature of running equipment that enables you to create a design the way a word processor is used by an author to create a book or to create to create text right well um i think i'll back up for a second when i started there were no computers to do this and um, and so the way we did it was um, called ruby lift. We used tape, and you and I would take a picture, and then turn it over and and make a a film out of it. And um, and everybody would put dots on it on a light table. And um, we didn't have printers to plot them out yet. And then he, then they started making. Um, green grid which they drew it in pencil and there was a digitizing machine and then you know after that this was when apple started they um the computers were huge and then they made um a couple um, small ones and so you could transfer the data and it the screen was green you know so that that whole process ended up you know innovating all kinds of companies within like five years between I'd say 76 
and 83, the whole valley changed. And, and it, was, it was so dramatic. It was first, uh, I think it was in the 70s, the mid-70s. Um, one of the guys that I was working with wrote a program to try to, to automate making a... Um, <laughs> it, it took a week for the computer to draw a transistor. So, um, you know, so that's kind of how far now you can just plop one down, you know, just click a button and it makes one. You know, it was like a big deal to have a, this huge giant computer plugging away for a whole week just to draw about eight rectangles. So, um, you know, a lot changed. And then at Compass is where I met Mike and, and Taylor and everyone. We, we had a fab, but we also were doing uh, tools, Compass Design Automation Tools. And, and there is where I specialized in the architecture of standard cells and then memories. I did the first memory compiler, first data path compiler. And, and then I started doing the place and route, you know, because they, they were developing the tool then. So after that was bought by Avanti and you know what happened to Avanti, that's when virtual silicon started. Right. And just to give people a little more background, because some people will be scratching their head and they'll say, what are you talking about? This is an area for which there are lots of topics and subtopics and lots of training and lots of software that you have to be specially trained on. But it's talking about what's often called very large scale integration, VLSI, not just the company VLSI, but the actual terminology VL, VLSI. And if I share my screen for a second and go to where I wanna show, just so people will see it, I have an actual slide on this. I think you could see it now. It shows kind of an actual VLSI product, which is the company name, but the company name is actually a generic name or acronym for very large scale integration, which is how do you put thousands of transistors into a single chip product. So a microprocessor like the Intel Pentium or whatever they call it now, P7 or I7 or I5, they have different names. Years ago it was Pentium. Before that it was the 8080, 8086. And before that it was something else, uh, 8086. There's a whole lineup of names and numbers but I see designers, integrated circuit designers, add various things to the process. And you were doing that. And you were doing that uh, at a level of sophistication that actually also enabled various tools to go forward, correct? Um, yes, and we were developing those tools. And at, the, at, at that time, it, it, um, it Compass, this was, you know, Mike and, you know, Clement and all of us were working at uh, Compass, well, VLSI technology, but our, our section became Compass. And we developed the CAD tools and they did the first uh, synthesis. And, you know, so, I mean, there was uh, a lot of innovation not being done at that time. You know, that, that was before we had internet. So, um, you know, was quite different. So a lot of innovation going on and every, you know, working on making a, 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 a compiler for a memory compiler was a whole new thing because before that you made each one. My first one that I did, it took two years to make a 1K static RAM. Now I could make it in a couple of minutes. Right. Uh, and um, so... So many innovations came about, you know, for, for me, what I saw was between 76 and 85, there was, um, and 89, there was, it was this huge explosion. Right. And over that, over that 15 year period, a whole number of companies grew up in the whole field of electronic design automation. Only a certain number of them survived. But the ones that survived became really, really, really powerful and big, comprising this field of electronic design automation. And the field of electronic design automation is itself now a collection of many, many, many subfields. Many, yeah. many subfields 
that essentially enable uh, all of the industry to exist. And there are even companies that provide courses like this company, Livewire, uh, that enable people to take the courses. I just picked this very quickly off the internet because it's going through all the different ways in which these companies have to teach people how to use these tools. And there are various, I'm not trying to advertise them, but there's various ways in which people use these tools. And so how long did you stay in this field? How long did you actually stay in the field of electronic design automation? That 15 year period? Let's see. If you take away 10, probably 37. Wow. So you're a veteran. Yeah, I've been doing this for 47 years. And you're still inventing now, right? Um, yes. <laughs> well, tell us, tell us what you do to remain creative because that's a big part of a podcast because we think Silicon Valley has some special magic that enables people to be more creative and more productive. Obviously, computers amplify everything. The fact that we can do these video conferences probably has saved America from a much higher suicide rate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, believe me, I, I totally agree. You know, one, one of the things, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I know a, a lot of people that have been, you know, huge innovators in this industry. And, you know, everybody comes from a different approach. My approach has always come from nature. And, you know, I, I look at what I do as art. And, and I see patterns in nature and go, oh, how could I put that together? How could I automate something in that, in that shape? And I think that's what I came to you in, a long time ago, years ago, and talked with you and, and uh, Bill Milks about was an idea that I had. And it's still relevant today. And, um, and so those, those are the kinds of things that, that allowed me to be able to obtain some of the patents that I have. So, um, you know, and, and things are, are, you know, in the industry is evolving. I know the majority of people think of technology nodes when they think of, of where they're at in the industry. You know, like when you look at the, the, the FinFET technology versus planar. You know, that planar is old technology. And so they look at seven nanometer, you know, uh, five, whatever. And, um, you know, so they look at the, the industry in terms of uh, Moore's law and how, it, how, you know, how things were done at different periods. So um, um, I think more in patterns, but it, uh, you know, people ask you a question you know, at, at a company, they want to know what technology node you're, you're working with. And, and that gives them a little clearer idea of what your knowledge base is. So, so when you think about kind of being a knowledge worker, because you are, you're an inventor, you actually know these design tools, you were there when it was done in pencil and paper. And tape, like tape, <laughs> yeah, tape. You were back in those days when I remember as a lawyer when we had typewriters, but even worse, cut and paste literally meant you cut and pasted with a scissor <laughs> and you had a light table and a light table was there as a way to try to be in a position to align things kind of the way you're talking about aligning things so the judges who read the page could read the page because we didn't have word processors yet. Oh, uh, we had light tables, and then we would put the things on, on the light table, and they were huge, and everybody would be climbing around on the top of the light table with a box of dots, with different right. colored of dots, right? right. And, and when they'd, they'd find an error, they'd put a dot. But then when you got off the table, people had dots stuck all over them, and they didn't know where that dot belonged, so they had to start over. So, you know, there's, uh, uh, those are the types of things that really helped people innovate in this valley. You know, that, I mean, there wasn't a DRC file. There wasn't a design rule checker. There wasn't, there wasn't Calma. I mean, um, what do you call that? Yeah, Calma, which, you know, became Cadence and all that stuff. But um, so none of that stuff existed. You know, if you wanted to change a rectangle, you had to put it into a binary. 
the, the coordinates into a binary and toggle it into the front panel of the computer. So um, a lot of things change, but it's, it's amazing the innovation that the, the struggles for, I'd say from the um, mid seventies to the um, mid to late eighties, so many things were happening here. So it, uh, it and it's, uh, it's still changing, but it's changing differently now. So, so let's just talk for a minute about your career and arc of your career. You've stayed in the industry, but you've had a hard time probably, as most people do as they get older. The industry likes younger and younger talent. It's, it's kind of the dirty secret, but. Tune in next on The Valley Current.